You may start. Uh, we are right now. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, a very good evening to everyone, uh, and a warm welcome to uh, all the attendees who have joined and uh, the esteemed panelists here on this webinar. Uh, on behalf of uh, NHRDN Pune chapter, I'm Dr. Neeraj Mankat, the treasurer. Uh, I welcome you uh, on behalf of uh, all my colleagues, uh, Anand Kot, Aman Rajabali, uh, Saima and Darpan, uh, and uh, Bhagat Singh, and uh, uh, the, the ones who uh, made this possible at the back end, Avinash. Uh, thank you, Advait and uh, Eklavya for uh, being such wonderful collaborators for all these years with NHRDN and uh, uh, you know, uh, being together on this uh, platform between the lines, which uh, personally I am always very excited to be a part of uh, and uh, hear the esteemed panelists. And moreover, uh, being an academic, it's a great uh, pinch to hear what the books say uh, as well. So a uh, great uh, summary I'm, I'm expecting once again from Eklavia. Uh, and thanks uh, once again to all the three panelists, uh, Prakash, Saurabh, and Anupam for joining us here. Uh, and uh, before I sign off, once again, thanks to Advait, Teklavya, and the entire Upuan team, and looking forward to many more such collaborations. Uh, over to you, Advait and Teklavya. Thanks, thanks Neeraj. Thank you for that. So uh, thank you, everyone, for logging in. And yeah, it's been an unprecedented response to this session. I think we've got close to 450 registrations. And the most heartening thing is that nearly 90% of them, or more than 90% of those are non-NHRD members. So for all of you who are not usually a part of the NHRD network or these sessions, a very warm welcome to all of you. And we hope you will enjoy what we have in store for you over the next one hour or so and you will be motivated to become a part of this uh, great network and as always our thanks to Neeraj, Aman, Anand and the entire NHRD backend team for supporting us wholeheartedly in this initiative. So just to give you a quick background in terms of you know who we are and what Between the Lines is all about. So Advait and I represent a Pune-based management consulting firm called Apohan and between the lines is a knowledge sharing and uh, endeavor that we launched nearly about three odd years ago and uh, it's a monthly event where we basically curate a session uh, which features around a theme that is carefully chosen and then we select a book that uh, usually i summarize and then there is a there's a very compelling panel discussion that Advait moderates with industry captains, veterans, leaders, uh, opinion makers. And that's the, you know, like the monthly event that we've been doing. And now this is, I think if I'm not wrong, Adwet, this is the 53rd session that we are conducting yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we've been very fortunate in getting some splendid panelists. And this time is no exception. So Neeraj, sorry to disappoint you, but I would not be presenting a summary of the book today because we've got two people who are much better placed to talk about the book that coincidentally they have written. That, <laughs> so, that's, that's better. <laughs> yeah, okay, I will take that personally, Neeraj. You didn't have to be so enthusiastic <laughs> about something that's better. But yeah, I mean, it's absolutely thrilling for us also because uh, as some of you know, we had gone back doing these physical sessions until this month. But now, of course, the situation in Pune is such that we had to come back to the online platform. And it's always fun doing online also because then we are not restricted in terms of the panelists that we wish to bring in. And we were absolutely fortunate that Saurabh and Anupam have agreed to spare some time and they'll be taking us through the genesis of this book and also giving us their inputs and views on what peak performance is all about. 
So without further ado, let's get into it. And for those of you who have registered without probably seeing what the program is all about, it's sort of been hard to do that. But the book that we've taken up this time around is called The Victory Project. And no prizes for guessing who the authors are, Saurabh Mukherjee and Arupam Gupta. And uh, the book has earned rave reviews across all platforms and literary circles. And this is a book that one should be uh, spending time reading during this current scenario that we all find ourselves in, because uh, it's very easy to get daunted in the face of what's happening out there. And I'm sure all of us are impacted in some way or the other. So The Victory Project is one of those books that offers a very easy to implement, easy to understand a six step mantra for what we would like to believe is scaling peak performance or perhaps even overachieving that. Now, one of the first things that you might feel when you actually look up this book, maybe on Amazon or elsewhere, you might think that this book is written by these finance gurus. So is it really for the layman also? Is it really for those of us who don't understand uh, you know, their jargon as well. And the answer is that there is something in it for everyone. I mean, very rarely will you come across a book where you will find stories about uh, Motila Loswal, you will find stories about the legendary professor and investor Sanjay Bakshi. And at the same time, you will find, you know, deep insights coming from uh, case studies on R.D. Burman and A.R. Rahman, uh, very rarely will you ever get to read some authors who have spent considerable time with Mark Mobius, who I think all of us would be aware of, and I'm sure all of us hold in very high regard. And at the same time, just to throw in a bit of more entertainment, there is Apurva Purohit from Radio City sharing his views on you know, simplicity and how he's built a huge empire around that basic tenet. So there's something in it for everyone. And there are these simple, easy to understand uh, six steps to peak potential, as they put it. Just to quickly take you through what the steps are. It's about specialization, so discovering specialization, simplifying your life, uh, connecting with your inner self. Then, of course, what's very popular nowadays, reducing everything, getting rid of all the clutter. Uh, developing your creativity and also owning your memory skills and finally collaborating or teaming up with the best out there. So these are the six steps that they've outlined in deep painstaking detail and it makes for a very engaging and fun read. And uh, this is something which again, like always, we've carefully picked this book because we would like to believe that it's something which all of us would benefit from immensely. And uh, without getting into a summary of it, let's get right into the discussion. Mm -hmm. And before I hand over to Advait, I'll just take you through, I don't need to, but I'm sure for some of those, uh, you know, who perhaps are not as aware of who all are joining us on the panel today, it would be a nice reminder of sorts. So we start off with Prakash Ayer. Uh, again, Prakash is of course, a very famous motivational speaker nowadays. He's on the leadership talking circuit throughout the year, pretty much. He's founded Leadership Works, which is into leadership consulting. And uh, similar to Saurabh, he's also got three books to his credit. In, uh, you know, incidentally, if you go and purchase uh, the Victory Project on Amazon, then one of the, you know, it gives you those suggestions that books you might also be interested in. One of those is also Prakash's books. So there's a huge similarity uh, that we have over here on the panel today. Uh, Prakash, of course, is famously known as the ex-MD of Kimberly Clark Lever. And before that, he was the CEO of Infomedia. He started off his career with uh, HUL, and he's also played various leadership roles at PepsiCo. And he was handling the international operations also for beverage giant. Uh, Prakash is an independent director on multiple companies, including Xerox, the PE fund multiples. And uh, most interestingly, he's an avid cricket junkie. And he was also the CEO for Mumbai Indians in their IPL title winning campaign back in 2015. 
So I'm sure you'll be able to share some anecdotes from that area of life as well. Uh, and Prakash, of course, he is from IIM Ahmedabad, and we are very, very fortunate to have him over here with us today. Unfortunately, there's a problem on the video, so we can't see him, but he's very much there. Yep. Oh, he's still not visible. I'm delighted to be with Saurav and Anupam and to talk about their fabulous book here. Sure. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Prakash. And uh, then, of course, we have Saurav. So Saurav is the uh, founder and chief investment officer of Marcellus Investment Managers. Yeah, and again, he's a finance industry veteran. Uh, he's also a CFA charter holder and studied from the London School of Economics. And Saurabh has, of course, been lauded and he's been feted by many investment journals and platforms. He was the leading equity strategist in India three years in a row. And uh, again, you know, just lending a different facet to his personality. He's got four best-selling books now to his credit. And uh, this one, I believe, was the third of the trilogy. So if you like this one, then you don't really have to wait for him to write another one. There's still three more that you can read upon. And sort of we certainly hope and wish that this fourth one is not the last and there will be more for us to sit back and read in the months and years to come. Thank you so much for sparing the time, Saurabh. And being here. joining us is Saurabh's co-author for this one, uh, Anupam Gupta, who has been an equity research analyst for many years. And he was also a part of Saurabh's team at Ambit Capital, where he was doing some very interesting research and report writing on very rarely research sectors or sectors that have not yet got the kind of importance that they deserve. So he's always, uh, it seems that he's always been one to basically look for the behind the scenes part of the story. And that really comes out beautifully in this book. And also I believe some of his work also provided uh, inputs for sort of previous book, The Unusual Billionaires. So this book, they have both been collaborators on this. And Anupam himself, again, I mean, we've got three really multifaceted personalities today. So the way Prakash is a motivational speaker, an author, a cricket junkie, and Saurabh is, of course, writing books by the dozen, Anupam is hosting a very popular personal finance podcast, Pesa Vesa. And again, you must listen to it. He's simplifying things that all of us normally perhaps don't pay enough attention to. And he's really creating a huge platform out there in terms of introducing especially youngsters to what personal finance means and how you can really get a sort of a, like a cutting edge when it comes to managing your own finances. So these are the panelists for today. And I think some of you would be aware that we were supposed to have Gajendra Chandel, the ex HR head of Tata Motors also with us today. Unfortunately, he's down with COVID and he couldn't join us, but yes, I'm sure that in the months to come, we'll have him back on the panel. So thank you, everyone, and over to Advait for today's panel discussion. Thanks, Eklavya, for the formal introduction. And uh, Saurabh, Anubam, and Prakash, uh, welcome again to this uh, Between the Lines session. Uh, Anubam, may maybe uh, I'll start with you. Uh, and you know, uh, Eklavya had mentioned about you know Paisa Vesa, Marcellus, equity research, equity analyst, brokerage. Uh, Prakash, of course, comes from a business CEO background. But uh, I believe this book is not just about uh, you know peak per potential and peak performance uh, only in the financial sector, right? It's all about you know irrespective of your profession. Somewhere I read, and of course it's I've read the book, of course, that it's more much beyond uh, this financial services or equity kind of professional or personal finance kind of uh, domain. So to start with, uh, just wanted to understand uh, what you know between the two of you, what made you, uh, what is the genesis of this book? What made you write this book? And uh, as Ekilva mentioned, it's a trilogy. So how does this trilogy work together? Uh, was that a, you know, did you think of the trilogy when you started writing the first book or how did it go about? Okay, so thank you, first of all, Advait, Ekilva, uh, good folks at Upohan. Thank you so much for having us over. Uh, this minor correction in what Ekilva said, Apurva Pura to the lady. So it's a she who was there in our book and in a, an absolutely fascinating meeting that we had with her the chapter of which is there in the book so yeah 
this book actually you know the origins go back to i think somewhere in 2017 or 2018 when we were sitting in this very wonderful cafe in lower parel in in bombay that sadly doesn't exist anymore it was called cafe zoe it had the most ah. awesome food and uh, over a cup of coffee we were talking about how we've covered the aspect of corporate excellence in the unusual billionaire sorab had written that book in i think 2016 and how companies can become great we then you know then sorab went on to write uh, the coffee can investing book which i think is now the largest selling personal finance book in india as it should be because we've got this very you got a dearth of books that are relevant from an indian perspective so that then translated into how you can make a portfolio out of these great companies and how that portfolio can actually transform your own life right because all of us work very hard for our goals and the money is an outcome of that if you can make your money work that much more smarter for you it makes life that much more easier the most logical extension after that was obviously how what what are the lessons for us to live a more to lead a more fulfilled life now we would know that india in the last whatever 20 30 years has just you know has has boomed even despite this last one year uh economy wise the achievement that a democracy of india size has done is probably unmatched where we've gone from 600 dollars per capita income to 2000 plus dollars now so but we know that this you know the the road to this prosperity hasn't been very very linear or or very equal we've had to work very hard uh and it's cost a lot of us mental peace mental health stress um there are various other health disorders all of this was true before even covid happened so can you actually achieve great personal success and great professional success that's where this book came you know it's kind of an ex- it's just a very logical extension of where we were in the previous two books to then have okay. this very simple framework what we call the simplicity paradigm and then build an entire book upon that uh, upon that framework and reach out to you know about 8 or 10 people that we that we admire and who we can see are living the simplicity paradigm so that's the background sure. for the book sure lovely lovely so sort of, but why this uh, peculiar uh, name for the book the victory project what is this victory and what is this project so part of it goes back to uh, sort of inspiration for trying to come up with a book which spans uh, business sport the creative arts um life in general right the, the whole that that memorable discussion in cafe zoe in july 2019 the hypothesis we had and in a way the book validates the hypothesis is that whether you are a uh, you are a executive whether you are a sports person whether you are a painter a martial arts art martial arts uh, fighter the core to excellence the core to outsize success is very similar right Uh-huh. and and through december 2019 jan feb 2020 that's when we those three months december 2019 jan feb 2020 that's when uh, with our penguin editor manish kumar anupam and i re- reached the final title and i suppose there were three things playing in our mind first was that a lot of books in the genre are called winning this and winning that right and you know as soon as you hear the word winning right it kind of makes it feel like a rat race and i'm running some sort of race and with 20 other people and it's some very insecure uh, uh, middle class affair that i'm part of right we didn't want to get into any of that we don't believe that any of us is running a rat race a rat race a race is a zero sum affair none of us is running a race uh, uh, if advait you get you become more knowledgeable and i benefit from the same book then it's not a zero sum affair both of us are richer because say if we read prakash ayer's book both of us become wiser it's not a zero sum race right life is not a race life is not a zero sum affair so we wanted to avoid this word winning right then the second thing was um, when when i had written unusual billionaires in 2016 right uh, uh, we had noticed that there were a lot of similarities between what what say the best companies do say asian paints is a company that we admire immensely and we've written extensively about it it's one of the greatest companies ever created on the face of the planet there's a lot of similarities between say asian paints and say rahul dravid as a batsman right and we sort of outline those similarities consistency process method right and therefore the link between sport and business uh, something that i understand prakash has also written about the link between sport and business was always something we had played around with and victory rather than winning victory was a word that had resonated and the final more practical thing that we have to concede is by the time we sort of finished writing the book and we sort of finished titling the book this whole moroseness the kind of national mood had dipped 
due to covid and we desperately wanted to give everybody a, a sort of a, a, a you know a, a shot in the arm a, a tonic and that's when we said rather than winning let's look for a more positive word which does not connote uh, uh, a zero sum game which connotes something that everybody can do we can all move forward we can all be victorious and that's when the victory project was christened interesting so if covid would not have happened the name would have been different perhaps so actually, come up with something less yeah i mean the default oh, no. the the default thing for, for for us would have been the simplicity paradigm ah okay because that's the core of it okay okay i believe uh, me, there was no that Hey, there, there was no way that we were going to go to how to improve yourself in 10 steps or winning the race <laughs> okay. 10 steps at a time. We didn't, we, we, yeah, we yeah. wanted to move away with this 10 steps, five steps winning thing. So that would not have been. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, sort of you mentioned about winning. Let me just take Prakash's view on this. Uh, unfortunately, there's still some challenge on his video, but uh, Prakash, you can hear us, I believe. I can hear you clearly. And I've got the yeah, advantage okay. position where I can see you and you can't see me, so I'm good. <laughs> okay, so uh, just wanted to get your perspective on what Saurabh has just said, that uh, in your own view, is there a difference between winning and achieving peak potential or peak performance? Or are they, uh, are one leads to the other? No, I, I think it's a great point Saurabh makes and uh, keeping semantics aside, I think it's important to recognize what he said, which is that life is seldom a zero sum game and it's about saying, hey, um winning tends to have that connotation of saying that i win and therefore you lose and sort of i was telling you that you know for whatever it's worth 10 years ago i wasn't as wise i hadn't read your books so my book was called something to do with winning <laughs> uh, but i tried to clarify in that book that you know winning is not about beating the other guy but becoming as good as you can be and and a winner is not necessarily someone who's beaten somebody else or got ahead of someone else but as someone who becomes as good as he or she can be. And I think to that extent, I find that there is some similarity between what you're trying to say in this book now, where you talk about peak potential. And, and I think that's a good thought. And I would go further to say that, you know, Anupam, to your point about not calling the book 10 steps or something, I really like it that you had to water it down to six steps now. <laughs> but having said that, I like the idea that you know victory at the end of it is really about saying look how do i get to peak potential how do i become as good as i can be and i think some of the stuff you've talked about over there is, is great stuff to say what can each of us do to hit our peak potential and i yeah. think that's a powerful idea and i quite sure, love what sure. you said. i'll 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 get back to you on that uh, anupam you did mention about the simplicity part of it and the, you know your book starts with the simplicity paradigm can you explain to us what that is and uh, how have you sort of got that into the book? Mm, yeah, so I think Prakash kind of gently pointed out that, that there are six six steps after all, despite what we yeah. what I might have said before, and I'm not going to defend that. Um, no editors tend think, to win over authors. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. You know, I I wish that I could think of this in linear way. You know, to call it if you do first, second, third, and then fourth, fifth, sixth. You know, the ideas that we had come up with was more that these you look upon this as a basic uh, building block anyway so to answer your question Adwait, the simplicity paradigm is essentially you know it's a it's a three block base on a three block behavior and then the results in the two so that's an eight triangle structure that you see there in the book so what we are saying is we we start with what we call first principles like how do you start this entire process of winning right you have to start somewhere so that's how we take the reader through the book, specialize, simplify, spiritualize. And then once one has gone through these building blocks, then you have specific behaviors, right? Declutter, a creativity and collaboration. You can see that the yeah. top tier is very distinct from the bottom tier. I mean, you can't, for example, you, you can't skip one part and go to the sixth part and then jump to that. We're saying that this is a rigorous process and this is how it so, works. So, so in a way, in a way it is bottom up. It, okay. Yeah, it is bottom up because, you know, victory is not going to be easy. Victory is going to be a process. A lot of us would like to believe that there is chaos in life and chaos can also lead to success, which, which it probably has uh, for, for some people. But what we found, the people that we've interviewed, the people that we've, uh, you know, studied about, they practice most of these aspects in some way or the other. Okay. Uh, Saurabh, uh, one of the things that you've dwelled upon in the book is what I have paraphrased as RTS, ready, not ready to serve, but uh, what you're mentioning in terms of reading, traveling, and socializing. 
and uh, you know across all the examples that you've given i think these three are common characteristics in a way uh, you know uh, as must have if you want to achieve peak potential uh, where did this come about and how have you correlated with the examples that you've given in your book uh you're on mute maybe thank you for for raising this uh, and giving us this uh, this very nice uh, mnemonic of uh, ready to serve uh, 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 this subject right of of curiosity of reading around of traveling meeting people from a variety of disciplines i'll, I'll explain in, in a minute how it links to uh, uh, the overall paradigm the simplicity paradigm but I'll, I'll also highlight an area of further work right an area that uh, uh, an area where we couldn't re reach a definitive conclusion right so let me first tell you what we figured out and then i'll tell you what we couldn't figure out it is it is it was very clear to us that when we met, interviewed people like uh, purva purohit of radio city sanjeev Vichandani of nokri.com uh, harsh mariwala ji of marico right? it was very clear both whilst writing uh, uh, the victory project and and whilst writing the unusual billionaires that unusually successful people uh, are able to cons consistently drive peak performance through 10 20 30 40 years because they are curious because they have a growth mindset uh, because they believe life is full of learning right they don't sort of say i am weak at this i am strong at that they say what can i learn how can i how can i improve myself improve my skill sets and so on Right. And 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 uh, uh, as uh, as as people as thinkers as diverse as Adam Grant uh, in our time and, uh, uh, and 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 going back 50 years, psychologists have shown there are some five very common drivers of creativity across the world across eras. And the first one, the first driver of creativity is 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 extensive reading. Right? Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, Charlie Munger has famously said that I've never met a I've never met a smart person who does not read non-stop, right? I've never met a smart, smart person who does not read non-stop. Every single person we interviewed for the Bukki project turned out to be a voracious reader, from Manish Sabarwal of Team Lease to Apurva Purohit uh, to Harsh Mariwala Ji. Right? Voracious reading seems to be intrinsic, in sense, seems to be central to driving creativity, opening up, opening up new possibilities, right? Tra Travel is part of a broader, broader uh, uh, habit of curiosity. Uh, you've gone mute again now. There's some connectivity issue, I think. Um, yeah, and his audio is frozen. Let's move yeah. on, Advait. I think we might have yeah. T of sure, sure. experiences. Yeah. Right? Uh, so perhaps, it is uh, but obvious that if you have a growth mindset, you will push yourself if you have a growth mindset. We haven't been able to get you there was a network issue at your site sort of so yeah maybe better now oh he's uh, he'll log in again uh, meanwhile uh, uh, prakash i know uh, you know we are talking of voracious reading uh, kind of thing i unfortunately again uh, we can't see you but uh, I've seen you in webinars uh, in various forums, and I know that if, if you, you were to have your camera on, we would have seen a whole uh, bookshelf behind you. And interestingly, a lot of cricket mem memorabilia behind your, uh, behind, uh, your desk as well. Uh, how, how do you correlate that? I mean, you, you are a celebrated author yourself, and uh, this voracious reading part, and uh, you know, the other two parts, which is traveling and socializing. What's your view on that? Um. I think it's interesting this whole you know discovery that sort of talks about that people that they met in their work everybody seems to be a reader um you probably find it's true and it's interesting that people as diverse as an entrepreneur like sanjeev bikchandani or a fabulously successful corporate leader like apurva or indeed someone like uh, mr mariwala everybody seems to be a reader i think the common trait there is curiosity and that's something which is very powerful. And that's something that I think Anupam and Saurabh, you know, seem to be talking about in that book too, which is this sure. whole desire to say, hey, what can I learn from here? How can I find something from here? And I think you will find that when you talk to people who've been really successful, consistently successful across fields, 
there isn't an attempt to to pretend i know it all or to try and say let me tell you how it's done there is almost a childlike curiosity to say really how does that work or wow i didn't know that and i think that's a great start to this journey of discovery of, of of finding something new and then trying to apply it and i think that's the second step which i found fascinating which is to say that it's not enough to say that i have read something or i read a lot but the attempt to try and say if i've read something can i share it with somebody else can i tell somebody else about what i have learned can i put what i have read or learned into practice in what i do I think that can become a hugely powerful multiplier. And I, I, I don't remember if, Saurabh, I may have got the facts wrong, but I seem to recollect somewhere you talk about, you know, how you, somebody tells you to read a paper. And if I remember right, this paper might've been 30, 40, 50 years old. And he reads that paper and that becomes an idea for a book and it becomes an idea for his business and becomes an idea, almost like an investment philosophy, which is all yeah. the whole idea of this coffee can investing. now. I think that is a that is something that all of us on this on this call can benefit from where you try and say hey if i have read something it's one thing to say i enjoyed reading it or you know bahut acha paper tha that is one way to look at it the other is to say can i put it into practice can i apply it that sure. can i think be life changing so it's not just about reading but also uh, the ability to recall uh, uh, you know uh, at will in terms of what you've read and like prakash said sharing that knowledge Absolutely. And I think that, that that point you made, right, that it's not about reading, it's about recall. Uh, in uh, in Daniel Kahneman's uh, uh, celebrated book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman's celebrated book on psychology, Thinking Fast and Slow, he actually says intelligence is, is in, uh, there's a lot of research which shows intelligence is nothing, nothing other than memory. The ability to recall the right fact at the right time at the right juncture. Right? Sure. And I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just do a two minute analogy of this in the context of Rahul Ravid's career. Right? We've, we've unfortunately never met the great man. I understand Prakash from one of uh, Prakash's books I was looking up. Rahul Ravid has written the foreword. But we've, we've read endlessly about Rahul Ravid. And there's a book on Ravid called Timeless Steel. Uh, Timeless Steel is a bunch of essays by uh, cricketers and, and cricket journalists from across the world. And if you read Timeless Steel, Rahul Ravid's career, his whole life, is in a way the simplicity paradigm personified. So he started off at a very young age. As per the book around age seven, age eight, he decided he wanted to become a cricketer. He liked cricket, right? He, so his, his specialization in cricket starts very early, seven or eight. By age 13, 14, he's simplifying the sport. He's saying, I will play in the V, I will play straight, um, I, will, I will play the ball along the ground, right? He started simplifying. By age 15, so there's a gentleman called Fazal Khalil who's in, interviewed in several uh, uh, several chapters of Time the Steel. He was Dravid's teammate in school in Bangalore uh, in the first class team of Karnataka Ranji. And he says that by 15, Dravid was meditating uh, before matches. So Fazal Khalil was Dravid's roommate. From age 15, Rahul Dravid has figured out that mental focus, discipline, reflection, calmness is a central thing, right? So fast forward to age 23 or 24, he's comfortably spent 10,000 hours, the famous Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours batting, thinking about the game. He makes his debut for India, famously in Lords in that test match where Saurabh Ganguly also debuted. But by 90, late 90s, 99, he gets dropped from the one-day team because he's not rotating the strike enough, he's not scoring enough, right? So he hits a, he hits a barrier. So the man goes back to his skill set. He reflects on his batting. He's a student of the Sunil Gavaskar school of thought. He's obviously read Gavaskar's books, Runs and Ruins, Sunny Days and so on. And he, he works on his technique for, for a year, couple of years. And he figures out how to rotate the strike. He comes back into the one-day team, becomes a keeper, becomes an essential part of India's 2003 World Cup runner-up. We didn't win the World Cup, but it becomes a very successful one-day cricketer, right? So here you have in front of 1.4 billion people, a world-class cricketer learning, reinventing himself in the context of one-day cricket and going on to become a very successful, not just one of the greats to play test cricket, but one of the most successful one-day cricketer. And guess what? Dravid reads. Dravid, so again, going uh, going back to his school days, from one Ranji match to another on the train, he was reading To Kill a Mockingbird. As he grows up and becomes a world-class test cricketer, he goes around the world, traveling, visiting historical monuments, reading endlessly. And the curiosity of the man 
drives him not just to be a great cricketer today he's the head of the national cricket academy in bangalore and he has created the 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 strongest bench for any cricketing nation any anywhere in the world and we have created yeah. a fierce cricket machine at the core of it the genesis of it is one man's triumph one man's epic triumph over everything life yeah. threw at him and that's the sure. power of the victory project that's the power of pushing one's oneself fantastic fantastic Fantastic. Anupam, in your view, is there any kind of hierarchy between this uh, reading, traveling, socializing? Does one come before the other uh, for, for anybody layman like me to achieve peak potential, peak performance? Do I need to go one one way or the other? Or I do I need to start I, think three things simultaneously? Not really. I think we've dealt with this specific question in the chapter on creativity. We sort of written at length out there about how creativity is essentially the engine of a lot of your um or a lot of your efforts right because we are now living in what is pretty much an open market and ideas are available by everybody a dime a dozen but what differentiates you is the kind of creativity that you can bring to the table and there's no form of there's no formula for creativity what we've done yeah. in the book what Saurabh's mentioned is you know read widely across across topics uh travel travel a lot although these these current circumstances might you know be some kind of a hindrance uh, jam with a diverse set of people. Now, whether you call that socialize or, you know, give it whatever name you want. What, one thing it should not be, and Saurabh has also said this in, in many forums, is in many forums, is this networking events thing. You know, that's not something that we are big fans of. I mean, socializing means having, you know, having sessions, conversations with people who intellectually stimulate you rather than tell you which talks to buy. Right? So there's a big difference between that. Yeah. or exchange cards that's not what we are talking when we say socialize a lot of socializing for some reason happens uh for that so there's no hierarchy out here but okay. there is a condition i mean in our view in our research you see that you have to do all of these things and not just one of these things like if you just sit in a room and read for years at a stretch maybe it might work for you but you need to add certain layers to that so i think that's sure, what we're sure. talking about sure uh, Prakash, coming to you, what would be your success mantra to achieve peak performance? I mean, we talked of, of course, reading, traveling, socializing, curiosity, curiosity. So obviously, curiosity kills the cat is passe now. So what would be your? Uh, uh, I'm not saying six steps or three steps or ten steps, but what would be your top uh, couple of things uh, towards peak performance? No, um, maybe the answer would be that actually there may not be a single mantra in that sense. And maybe mm -hmm. that's something to try and adapt. I think uh, I have often felt that um, success leaves tracks. So if you look at other people and see what they've done and what's got them ahead and try and do some of those things, I think this is not to suggest, therefore, that you should be a copycat or necessarily try and do everything that they do. But there are clues to success. And, and maybe it's a good idea to try and follow that. And therefore, you'll find people read, people try and, you know, I've been fascinated by this. This idea that, look, if you read, uh, one of the things that you should do is to try and not try and confine yourself to one area of interest. Just this ability to read across areas and then cross pollinate. And, you know, and I love the way uh, Anupam and Saurabh do this, which is to say that, you know, you, you look at Rahul Dravid and now come up with saying that, look, there's a lot that's common between principles of investing or making money and succeeding in life. And mm. that's what I think curiosity can do for you. If I was to try and say, is there a mantra, you know, similar to what I think you're, you, you, you've talked about over here, I would say that there are a couple of things I've seen as being common to people. And at some stage, I try to say that maybe there is a clue here, which is to say that if you want to hit peak potential, maybe you should have a PhD. Okay. Uh, and then I say you must have a PhD. Maybe the idea is not to say you should now start reading and go and do a PhD in that subject, but to say that having those three things, and I call it the P, the H, and the D, where A, the P is passion. You've got to be passionate about what it is. And maybe at some level, this is the simplicity of figuring out what you want to do. What are you passionate about? What really excites you? I think that's important, this passion. The H is hunger. And that hunger is to say, hey, I want it. I want to be successful. I want to be good. If I'm a 16 year old cricketer, I want to play for Karnataka and I want to play for India. If I'm a successful test cricketer, I want to become a good one day cricketer. So I think this hunger is important. 
So there's a passion, there's hunger, and the third is the D, which is the discipline of sticking it out. And I think what happens very often to people is that you can feel that this is, you know, flavor of the month, it's a fad, and try and do something for a while, but success requires you to stick it out. And I think, you know, call it grit, call it consistency, call it, you know, whatever you will, this ability to stay disciplined about it, to stick with it, to do it day after day, you know, I think that's important. And I love the story of a gymnast who was apparently, you know, she won a, a gold medal and they asked her how she did it. And she said, pretty simple, actually. I practiced whenever I felt like it and when I didn't feel like it. <laughs> but I think that second bit is critical. And most of us are halfway to winning a gold medal because we do things when we feel like it. Success comes when you do things even when you don't feel like it. So it's that thing about, you know, bro having broken a finger and yet saying, no, I still will go out and bat or, or I will still go out and push myself to do something. You know, it's very cold, it's freezing, but you still get up and say, I need to do that, you know, run 10 kilometers because that's what will keep me fit. I think those are sure. the things sure. that can help us to get it right. Sure, lovely. Uh, Saurabh, uh, just taking on to what uh, uh, Prakash just mentioned about his PhD, the passion, hunger and discipline. Now, one of the things you've said in the book is that, uh, you know, one common trait that you found across, you know, successful business people is their ability to fiercely concentrate over extended periods of time on complex material. Now, in today's, uh, and you, you use the word digital jail. Now, in this digital jail that we live in, where attention spans are so less, how do you sort of uh, correlate this? On one hand, attention span is low, knowledge is democratized, Google, WhatsApp University, so on and so forth. I know you're not on WhatsApp, but um, uh, how do you then ensure that you have this concentration over a long period on complex material? How do you balance this out? So look, I think first, let's just quickly understand the power of it. And, and again, just to uh, just continue with the Dravid example. Dravid has played more balls in test cricket than any cricketer in, in the history of the sport, right? Oh, wow. and, and so we all know that he's, he, he's scored a lot of centuries, he's averages 55 and so on. But, but one of the reasons he's been so good is he's been able to play longer. He literally has been able to play longer than anybody else in the history of test cricket has, has been able to do, right? Now, obviously, he's worked on it. That discipline, the concentration, the meditation, the spirituality has all helped him build immense powers of concentration, right? Now, we're not, you know, very few of us have that sort of powers of concentration. What can we do to, to, uh, to improve our, our ability to focus, right? The ability to focus, uh, if anybody needs convincing, the book to read is Cal Newport. Uh, uh, he's written beautifully about deep work. The book is called Deep Work, Cal Newport, about the need to to focus and let your brain, let your neurons get connected. So there's a lot of research which shows that if you do neural imaging of our brains, people who focus, concentrate, and develop uh, uh, deep, deep uh, skills, their neural networks become denser. And if you take two people at the age of 20, one of them goes on to do concentrated work through their 20s. The other one has a wild blast of a party through his 20s. At 30, when you do the neural imaging, the, 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 the fellow who's concentrated, his neural network is completely densed up, muscled up. The other fellow, poor guy, has got left behind. And once you get left behind, it's very difficult to catch up then, right? So deep work, concentration, central to success in the knowledge, knowledge oriented world where we live in, central to creativity. How can you do it? A big part of it, again, referencing Cal Newport and his work and his book, Deep Work, is cut off, cut yourself off from a lot of what is called social media these days, right? Including, I'm using it in the broader sense of the word, uh, for long swathes of the day, text messages, whatever, WhatsApp, emails, phone calls. If you spend your whole day yeah. answering the phone and you know answering text messages and WhatsApp and whatever notifications, uh, you're gonna get killed in the knowledge economy. Right? You'll be a coolie in the knowledge economy. If you want to rise, if you want to succeed in the knowledge economy, you have to learn how to cut off distractions and give your mind four or five hours at least every day of concentrated deep work. Right, And you can't sort of blame anybody post facto. You can't say when you're 40 or 50, he was chance ni mila kyunki main WhatsApp kar raha tha. Right? Because it was your own fault. Why didn't you First, switch the phone off, get it out of the room and focus for four or five hours. And it's got, you know, in a way, COVID has made it easier rather than harder. Right? At least on a normal weekday in the pre-COVID world, you had the excuse boss phone kar raha tha. Now, so everybody knows you're at home only, no? And everybody knows your boss knows you're at home. So what's the excuse now for not doing deep work? And this is, I think, central. 
and a big part i think of the challenge that digital media is posing for people is they are not being able to harness it for their own good they are using it to fragment their concentration and again there's a lot of research to show if you fragment your concentration uh, the least of your concerns would be declining productivity of work it has more deeper impacts on psychological well being okay lovely okay uh, anupam you did mention about creativity and like you said there's been substantial kind of thing uh, discussion about creativity being original uh, original thought uh, in the book now uh, one of the things that has been mentioned is also in terms of uh, you know seeing the world from unusual or unexplored angles now is that you know how does everyone get into being creative and start looking at the world from unusual uh, kind of thing is it like a imperative without which i cannot really achieve my peak potential well it goes back to what we had discussed right? i mean creativity is, is what's going to separate you from from the crowd now electric vehicles are something that existed back in probably the 19th century or early in the 20th century what was the big deal about that but hmm. elon musk did certain things and took the same idea again and you can just use that example over and over again to a steve jobs with the iphone whatever it is these are people who are able to look at things very very differently and create different products after a lot of failure a lot of discipline so when we talk about creativity in in this way it's exactly that how do you develop different perspectives to look at the same thing in a way that others aren't and there is a process to that there is a method to that when we look at the example of a sanjeev bikchandani this is a person who uh, you know at every point of his career he took decisions which were counterintuitive goes to an im you would think that he would land up at a levers or a nestle lands up at some obscure fmcg company in the south does his mba comes back could you know could have done anything anywhere sets up his own thing and even out of the one thing that he wanted to do he could have just joined his batchmates and went out to the us this was the 90s you had to go to the us why to care so think up no but he said i'm going to open i'm 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 going to start my own firm okay great so now you start your own firm you're in in the 90s choose something you want to do if it was somebody else you probably set up a software firm you know become i've forgotten the word that we used to do at the, that at the, i i think it used to be called body hunters or something hr stuff coding stuff no but this guy says everybody you know let me set up a job portal why because he's working in the place where he was and whenever a magazine hmm hindustan milk marketing that was the company he was at yeah HMM, which eventually yeah. got acquired by i think glaxo Modern. or something yeah yeah and then he says that okay if i am going to set up you know a firm let me do it with what i can see now he sees people working where he is and the minute that a jobs listing would come these are people with well secured jobs but they are still searching the entire job listing just to see how much they are worth none of them will apply by the way but they are going to read that with a lot of focus so you can see at every point you know at every point he's taking decisions that nobody would have taken at that point of time when we asked him you know how did this go back because the first thing you want to say are you born this way you know is this genetic he said he just looked at us and said no you know i my father was a government doctor so i knew that a i will not be in the government and b i will not be a doctor that's it that's it that's it you know that's it or you take ramdev i mean you know there are so many examples of all of all these people that at every point in their life they could have gone the conventional way but sure. they refused to do that so it's hard to say sure. what drives certain people you know but this is what we have written in the book is what we feel i mean sort of the, another great sure. example lands from the uk in in bombay in 2007 2008 enters what was that and i i know this because i was working in the broking industry since 1999 in what was the largest institutional broking house in india and everybody and their aunts and cats and dogs would say that nobody in his right mind would want to set up a new brokerage why would you do that it's something that's dominated yeah. by people but no so sora had a certain formula and by the time he was finished with broking he had taken ambit to a certain position so i'm saying that you know all, all of this has a method to it and it starts with seeing a certain problem and saying that this is not the only way to see the problem there are other there are other, other ways to see it sure uh, prakash uh, talking of uh, peak performance and what drives it or what leads to it uh, you were at the helm of affairs as, as ceo of mumbai indians when they won their uh, maiden i believe their maiden ipl title and since then they've sort of done it five or six times i think five times more 
and everybody is hoping and that they're going to win it again this year i'm pretty sure they're going to win it again this year not a good start but yeah let's see so uh, if you have like to they've sort done of, for the uh, last few times they always lose the first match and yeah i know i know uh, so prakash uh, if you have to sort of uh, dwell back in terms of uh, you know uh, your role there how would you summarize in terms of what led to them winning that title and kept on winning for four or five more years what was their mantra for this peak performance at the highest level in indian sporting uh, cricket so the the first a couple of clarifications which is the smaller one is that it wasn't the first year so i was there with them with them in 2015 and okay. they had already won it in, you know in 2013 so that's not but uh, okay. of course so they've had a fantastic it. run and they've been a great team and nothing to do you know one of the good things they do is <clears throat> to make sure that people who have no idea of cricket like myself don't really interfere with with you know people who actually know what is to be done um i think there are a couple of things that can help what makes them tick i think they have a and apart from the fact that they've got a great team i'll try and focus on a couple of things which may not be as well known i think they have a fabulous talent scouting mechanism uh, so they've got people like a kiran more or a john wright who are full-time into watching out for that next big thing that's coming in you know and that's an interesting way to look at it so if you look at some teams you might feel that they've got a lot of stars but you don't know what happens when those stars will go away and do we have a plan to bring in the next set of game changers or winners into the fold whereas mumbai indians you know i remember that there was this young kid skinny kid who came in in 2015 had been doing reasonably well in baroda and playing well and i think kiran more saw him and said you know acha ladka i've got him in and if nothing else he was a great fielder and that's always a good thing to have and he could bowl and bat a bit but having got him suddenly you see a ponting who was the coach at that time say wow i can see something great in this kid here so let's give him a chance so what do you do a you bring in you find raw talent you bring it in and then you give that talent an opportunity and suddenly that kid was begin to bowl in the death overs uh, when you were in trouble he was being pushed up the batting order to go and hit a few sixes and win a few games for us and he played without any fear and that kid who came in at 10 lakh in 2015 we bought him at 10 lakhs 3 years later was retained at 9 crores okay wow. and even in saurabh's great investment returns i'm guessing this is a pretty good good <laughs> deal of what what you can get out of someone and that kid is hardik pandya you know and i think wow it it just goes to show that if you have a good way of finding the next winner you're not only looking at who other people have spotted as a winner uh, and then you back that talent and you will see that that's a recurring story in mumbai indians people get supported and as recently as that last game you know you had a rahul chahar come on television and say that you know i think sometimes my captain backs me more than i back myself <laughs> yeah yeah now those yeah, are i think the lesser known things about what makes a team great how do you create a sense of security you want it's a team that wants to win and yet people are told you know what we trust you we trust your ability now you go out there and do what you know you're good at and therefore you have talent like surya kumar yadav who might have been with another team earlier gets released and comes to comes here and plays well you have adishan kishan who in many ways was you know wicket keeper choice number 4 in a in a country teaming with wicket keeping batsmen and he comes in and starts doing great stuff so i think there there is that's what i think helps them to create the magic here. so they get great yeah. talent and i would touch on something else that i think anupam and saurabh talk about in the book which is this whole idea of of perhaps collaborating or creating yeah. a culture of excellence saying it's not only about us here it's not only about being great batsmen or great bowlers so you will find that they bring in great coaches okay and i know for a fact that some of the cricketers say you know being part of mumbai indians is like getting a ticket to you know in a corporate sense saying that hey i may not give you too much money but you'll get a chance to go to harvard business school so you get to train with a shane you know with a bond or you get to train with a ponting or navita mahila that's priceless because those are people who will actually change your life and some of these kids will perhaps go on to play for other franchises but we'll talk about how their time at mumbai indians made a difference to their careers mm. interesting interesting uh, interesting point you made about collaboration and sort of i'll come back to that to you on this point where uh, you know you have looked at collaboration from a very different unusual angle as i would use your words uh, but you're saying it is a team of rivals so you're talking of a different kind of collaboration you're not a coach or a player or not a collaboration between teams within the same company etc but across rivals 
Oh, what's this team of rivals theory you have? So, so let, let's just back up the truck a bit. I mean, this was the big area of learning for Anupam and me as we wrote the as we wrote the Victory Project, right? And it started really four years ago. An American fund manager called Jason Voss, who had written a book called The Intuitive Investor, he came to Mumbai to give a lecture on the book, and I attended that uh, and met Jason for a few minutes after his lecture had been given. It was in the Taj Lands and in Bandra. So when we were writing this book, right, uh, uh, I told Anupam, let's do a Skype. Let's do a Skype with Jason and understand why in his book, The Intuitive Investor, uh, Jason Jason talks about collaboration in the context of investing. Right? So Jason Voss's view, which we have explained in the book, uh, when we have profiled him and his book, Jason's view is this whole notion that capitalism or the or business enterprises can be one because of star individuals. That's a dead notion. Right? Forget about uh, running a cricket franchise or a or an investment bank or a fund manager shop. You can't even run a restaurant by yourself. Right? You need collaboration. It's at the core of any any uh, uh, creative activity. Other than say combing or combing your head, other than combing your head and reading a book, you need collaboration to achieve every other useful outcome in life. Right? So so we sort of got that concept from Jason, and then as we as we read further, we realized there are three more. The three more sort of subtleties in this collaboration concept. Firstly, um, you can have collaboration without a overarching leader. You can have collaboration without a CEO or a president saying "ye karo, wo karo." Great example of that: India's Marwadi community, nine million people, incredibly collaborative, right? By far the most, by far the most uh, uh, successful community in terms of impact to GDP on a per capita basis, right? Marwadi GDP divided by 9 million would beat any other uh, community hollow, right? And yet the Marwadis don't have a sort of president who says this Marwadi will help that Marwadi. And all of us know wherever we live in India, this is a close knit community which helps each other without any central diktat to do so. Right? Second subtlety, you can have collaboration without a financial motive, without a profit motive, right? Example, Amul. Thrice as big as Nestle. If Amul were a listed company today, it would be thrice as big as Nestle. So Nestle's market cap is about 22, 23 million dollars. Nestle India. Amul agar listed hota, market cap would be 60, 70 million dollars, right? Amul gets milk daily from something like 10 lakh uh, individual milk producers in Gujarat. That milk gets aggregated to thousands of cooperatives, which gets aggregated to the main dairy in, in Anand, right? And yet there is no profit motive which is driving it. Right, Amul is done. is a cooperative. Its goal is to give the the milk producer a better deal. And yet, you and I get on our breakfast table, right, world class dairy products, which defines the life of every Indian. There is no profit motive in the heart of it, right? So that's the second subtlety. No leader, no profit motive, and the third piece, right? The most powerful teams are teams where individuals with different skill sets, opposing views, come together. They come together and it's the it's that's the essence of a great team where different perspectives are clashing and the the sum of the parts is greater than the whole so best example of this the cabinet the first post independence cabinet that india saw mahatma gandhi ji he brought together people as disparate as baba sahib ambedkar and and and, and sardar patel political rivals very different perspectives right baba sahib ambedkar political rivals bhimrao ambedkar and sardar patel different perspectives and yet that team, those men collaborated to give us the constitution which governs our lives in India today. Right? Sure. Collaboration, I think, is one of the biggest, uh, 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 the most most underrated subjects in, 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 in sort of this literature around performance and management and so on. And a lot can be done written on this. I think we've just scratched the surface. Incredibly, incredibly interesting subject. Interesting. Uh, Anubam, taking on this point of collaboration and the last point that you mentioned in terms of you know looking at uh, you know building a team of rivals or when i say rivals it's a different points of view like you mentioned now in practice uh, do you believe that leaders or even mid 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 management people have that uh, what should i say maturity to say that you know i am okay with somebody in my team not necessarily agreeing to me and nodding at whatever i say and being yes men uh, to me and uh, and maybe you know uh, they are right sometimes do, do, do people have that kind of maturity otherwise how do we build a team of rivals and how do we collaborate i think the greatest companies do right i mean that's why they're great we've taken the example of a tcs we've taken the example of an hdfc bank in hdfc bank we've shown how even though aditya puri's uh, you know his 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 top down leadership style was legendary 
he still had it in him to manage the you know the ambitions of various people who were business leaders and just remember that in case of an hdfc bank the people who lead the divisions are as good as ceos of banks in their own right because this mm-hmm. is the largest bank in india and their loan books across segments would probably be the size of a small bank so how do you manage such people how do you become you know a 100 billion dollar bank deliver knockout results quarter by quarter all throughout so i think that's leadership for you i think what we call corporate culture goes back exactly to what prakash said about the mumbai indians example the fact that you've got talent you've got an eye for it and more importantly you mentor it right that we've spent a lot of time in a book on the topic of mentoring this is unfortunately it's still a very i i would say a relatively new topic in india for some reason or at least my generation i have no idea if things are changing now because i you know i don't have an active job in terms of a salary so but what i've seen is that our corporate culture is more of sink and swim as in i am your boss i will push you to the deep end now you manage if you yeah. swim then you're great if you sink then you're wrong you know maybe that was relevant at some point of time i have you know maybe it was maybe it wasn't and i don't know whether that still works for a lot of people mentoring was non existent because and maybe for a good reason because thinking at one point of time you should be that you need to have the innate ability the entrepreneurism to show in your job to prove to your boss that you are great okay which might have been true at some point of time but i feel that as an organization grows if you have to nurture talent you're going to need a very 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 different corporate culture look at tcs right never choose a ceo from outside ever ever at all groomed from within and groomed in such a way i mean and the statistics on tcs are staggering it's something that saurabh says in you know in in many of our talks the fact that tcs is market cap is more than the combined market cap of all its peers and has been so for a long period of time should tell you that they are doing something differently so i'm saying you know when we look at these example you just take something like an asian paints or a marico where the owner promoter founder woke up one point and said that's it i'm done i don't want to manage this company anymore let me just take a step back and let the professional manage it i'll be a non exec chairman i'll be a mentor i'll i'll be a guide but i'm not going to be the guy to tell that okay distributors will get so much margin or quarterly result so i think so the so there's no black and white answer to your question but i feel that this culture is changing and i hope that people realize that a change is required sure sure now just uh, of, uh, just to sort of finish that thought the era of the you know hitler like ceo or the hitler like malik who will sort of bark out orders every morning and say utho batho ye karo wo karo wo zamana is khatam right and those promoters or ceos who haven't figured out that they have to run decentralized constructs decentralized construct with decision making rele- delegated right the stock market and the ipl are saying tata bye bye we have no need for you right so we've got to be created a stock market in india today where 90% of india's profits 90% of corporate india's profits come from 20 companies right so in india either you delegate professionalize uh, modernize and dominate or the stock market says you can stay listed boss you can stay listed boss but aapke stock mein kisi ko dilchaspi nahi hai so you have tcs uh, as anupam said the tcs is revenues or market cap together is hcl tech plus infosys added up usse bhi zyada actually right and you know how thousands of chota 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 uh, uh, it consultancies in pune bangalore where the malik comes in saying boss main boss hu everybody listen to me everybody is listening to them but nobody else gives a monkeys about them khatam zamana hai okay. yeah yeah so uh, prakash if you are talking of this decentralized kind of uh, regime uh, towards peak performance one of the things is you know people always look at some kind of directions coming from the top and recently you you came out with a post of you know finding your map kind of things so how do you you know you want to talk about that which is a wonderful article that you written yeah um okay the finding your map is actually making a slightly diff- it's a story about uh, a group of hikers who were on a trek in the alps and it's a story that professor gulati professor ranjay gulati at harvard business school apparently shares um so it's a group of hikers out on the alps and they get lost and they don't know uh, where they are what to do they're beginning to lose hope and quickly getting disillusioned when suddenly one of them discovers at the bottom of his bag somewhere as he is trying to look in he finds a map 
and um, a couple of days later they reach safe to safety and uh, everybody is happy and then they're celebrating and, and and then one of those guys pulls out that map to take a look at it and he discovers that it's actually a map of the andes and not a map of the alps <laughs> Uh, and I think the point that Professor Gulati makes is a pretty simple one to say that, you know, sometimes any map is a good idea, even a wrong map can work. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's as much talking about, I think we lost a lot of people suddenly. Uh, yeah, I can tell you, but uh, there seems to be some challenge. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think so the point he makes is it's important to keep the faith. It's important to have that map, which is in some sense is giving you hope that there is a plan, there is a bigger idea plan that will take me to where I need to be. And just having that faith, keeping that faith can actually help us help us to get there. Um, having said that, of course, and I, I found that there were a lot of interesting responses to it where somebody said that, you know, I was once using uh, Google Maps and it took me to the wrong place and I was lost. But I told myself, I can't be lost because I have Google Maps. So it will get me to where I need to be. And I think that's a good way to look at well, how does this work? And, and it's a great example. So there will be times in the life of a TCS or of any of these other great businesses where things can look like they're going wrong, but there will be a fundamental faith, a fundamental belief in the system that there is a, there is a map somewhere. We know what we'll need to do to get there. And it might be a bit of a detour. We might go wrong for a bit, but, but we will get there. I think it's a great point that sure. uh, both Anupam and Saurabh have made about, you know, how no longer is it about about Hitler-like CEOs or people who get it, you know, people who think they'll they know everything. I think it's it's pretty much a thing of the past. And, and sort of, I'm not even sure if even in small businesses this is now, you know, I think people have realized that success comes out of being able to pull together great teams. Uh, success comes out of leaders who are willing to say, Pata nahi yaar, mujhe nahi malum hai. Aapko kya lagta hai? you know, what do you think is a very powerful line for a leader to have rather than to say, guys, I know it all, you know, that's the way to go. Uh, just being able to say, I don't know, being unsure, trying to bring in talent, which might have the answers. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's, sure. that's often the way to kind of get it right. Yeah. Uh, the way I've tried to sort of paraphrase it in, uh, in some of my other discussions is leadership is no longer about dictation, it's about direction. And you're there to provide a broad direction, you're not there to dictate ye karo, wo karo, and, and the map, therefore, is a lovely is a lovely analogy. Map is The map is available to the team and the leader's job is to broadly make the map available, but his job is not to say, go from you know Bandra East to Santa Cruz following this route, because he has no way of knowing whether that is the route or indeed whether that is the destination. Sure, lovely. Uh, looks like the discussion is circling back uh, in terms of you know the the, the leadership traits that that we talked about, and you know the, that you can't have that no all attitude. I mean, in the, in the when we were discussing this reading habit, uh, this point did come up again. Prakash ji did mention that. Uh, so, is it about uh, you know a, a sort of a road to success? Is it about leveraging your strengths, uh, Saurabh, or working on weaknesses, or is it a mix of both? This strengths, weaknesses, this is also a very outdated concept, right? And I'll tell you why it's an outdated concept. If I if I if I am curious and I want to learn new skills, obviously any new skill I want to learn, right, is a weakness in the Purana jargon. So if though I will never do anything in life, I'll I'll know five things, that will be my whole life, and life will stagnate very swiftly for me. And you know, the, the victory project will become the, the mediocrity project, right? So so the way to think about it. And again, I'll, 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 I'll stick to the Dravid analogy. Is uh, if you look at his career, he he developed a set of skills through his teenage years, through his early twenties, a certain style of batting. Right? It worked wonderfully well for him in Test cricket from the get-go, from that uh, uh, superb debut in Lords to to I think he really, really never looked back in Test cricket. Right? But that skill set which worked for him in Test cricket, there were technical flaws that he had. Right? And and again, there's two different books: the Timeless Steel book. And there's a separate book by uh, uh, the, the, the biography of Dravid, uh, where a psychologist called B.P. Bam uh, highlights the, the technical defects that he had, which meant that in late 90s, he wasn't being, he dropped, he got dropped from the one day team because there was a technical defect, which meant he was leaning over to the, he was falling over as he was flicking the ball and uh, operating the leg side. He wasn't being as successful on the offside, right? 
Now, this is where there is no weakness or strength. It's a growth mindset. It's a learning attitude. Right? Mm -hmm. I will learn better. Hunga. He goes away, works on his technique. John Wright has sort of written extensively about how, how fanatical Dravid was on working on uh, any perceived weaknesses he had and it emerges as a highly accomplished one day batsman, right? And that I think is a modern day career for any of us. If tomorrow uh, 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 Ravi Ashwin got recalled to India's uh, uh, white ball cricket side, right? Ravi Ashwin will come back a different bowler to the Ravi Ashwin who got dropped from India's white ball cricket side in 2017 when we lost that final to Pakistan in, in London, right? And, and that is the that is what separates people who are outsized successes from the average Jew. The average Jew says, Mereko ye cheeze aata hai. Ye, this is what I'm good at. Iske boss, aap bahar mat bolo, mera weakness hai. Right? Aap bolo ke weakness hai, pata nahi kya ho the, 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 the champion says, and the champion can be someone doing a, a job that you and I don't know about. I'm using cricket because it's something we know about. But the champion sure. analyst, champion chef, the champion uh, 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 a dancer says, there is no question of strengths or weaknesses. It's just a question of learning, learning and expanding my horizons. And that is the attitude, which I think makes it not just a question of successful. It makes life very purposeful. It makes, makes life very, very joyful. It makes life victorious. Sure, sure, sure. So Anupam, uh, sort of just mentioned the word of attitude. Now, between attitude and skills, you know, these people say, you know, there's a HR thing and a lot of HR folks here in the on the call today. Hire for attitude and train for skills. Hats, hats, hats framework. So how do you oh, sort of <laughs> one more acronym? I had no idea. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't know it's an acronym. When I heard it for the first time, it was from the master himself. Uh, you know, the person that both me and Saurabh look upon as a kind of a Yoda, kind of a Shifu, kind of a Gandalf, kind of a Dumbledore. And we were very lucky to have to sit with him in his luxurious uh, uh, house in Delhi. Uh, I'm talking of Gurcharandas. Uh, yeah. And there, again, another one of those people where you've got ceiling to floor books and all that. And he very calmly told us about this story, which actually forms part of the foreword. That's the first time I heard about hire for attitude and not for skills. You call it hats or whatever it is. And I just, <laughs> I was just mind blown. I'll, I'll, you know, I won't tell you the full story, but I'll just summarize it in, in three, four lines. He talks about this security guard who rose up to become a director at a certain company only because he was so deeply passionate about his job. Some examples. Whenever, you know, this this was an era in which you had an EPBAX system. I don't know, you know, the average age of India today, half of the people were in, are born after 1991. So they might not even know what is an EPBAX system. But notwithstanding that, this is someone who was first charged with standing at the door to open the door and be the security guard, went on to handle the EPBAX system and then just rose above only because he had that passion in him to do something for the company. It's a... I don't, you know, hire for attitude for skill is something that is, is an antithesis to a lot of people. Because if you don't hire from a, from an IIT, I am, how, do, how are you assured of talent, right? If you hire someone from maybe a third rung or fourth rung, whatever it is, you're not sure of anything. So without going into that aspect of how it's antithetical, it has a lot of power in it, right? Because you're taking in someone who might not have the educational degree, but has deep, you know, who has a lot of, a lot of you know an ability and a desire to win and this person will succeed no matter what it's difficult to find such people right because these are not your normal kind of people so hire for attitude not for skill great rule to aspire for still has some long way to go i think sort of you want to just add on to that as Is someone you know who's hiring you've learned big time from this that you a business school mein gai ho, you know which mommy daddy you come from which you know lovely posh a convent school you have gone to, we couldn't care less. So one of the things we learned was, as soon as you get into this business ki CV bejo, you start biasing your brain because you start looking for people like yourself. So in all recruitment in Marcellus, we say we don't care about your CV or your name. Here is a link, click on the link. Here's a test, right? Depending on the job description, the test will be accordingly. If you do well in the test, uh, and if you're in the top 10, 10 people in that test, we will call you for an interview. That, that's only when, we will see your face. Even then, we don't care about your CV. We will assess you on case questions when you come to the test. So again, in a way, just as the dictatorial uh, dictatorial CEO is history, this whole notion that I will get branded education, I will get branded education and I'll rise in the world, that too will soon become history. 
इनफैक्ट द होल नोशन की मैं फॉर्मल क्वालिफिकेशन के दम पे जॉब ढूंढूंगा दैट टू विल बिकम हिस्ट्री बिकॉज कौन सा फॉर्मल क्वालिफिकेशन लोगे बॉस बाय द टाइम यूर थर्टी वट यू लर्न इन कॉलेज एट ट्वेंटी विल बी रेलिवेंट right by the time you're 60 you would have had to reinvent yourself twice over so there's a lot there's a lot happening in the way we perceive performance and qualification we perceive merit right and a lot of merit increasingly will be reevaluated not from your pedigree or your lineage or your education or your or your qualifications it's about on the day can you show me you can deliver right if you are hardik pandya you can deliver a, a, a 160 cut strike rate in the last five overs of an ipl every team will want you who's who coached you who coached you kaun sa batting manual aapne padha nobody will care about because you will say yeah. main last five over mein run rate triple kar deta hu everybody will say i will pay 20 crores to uh, buy this guy sure and advait you might want to bring in prakash here right because the stories in cricket are just mind boggling if you look at what krunal pandya had done that very emotional scene that had played out if you read into how and why that happened or you yeah. look upon chetan sakarya the very young kid uh, who delivered you know i mean i would love to have prakash's views on this about so, how prakash but public demand more ipl anecdotes from you on this <laughs> higher for attitude not for skill <laughs> yeah i think um, before i answer that question i just want to say uh, and i'm probably speaking on behalf of everybody else who's been on this panel that uh, I, this is the first time that I'm actually getting to meet or listen to Anupam and Sora, but I'm a big fan now. I'm a convert here. I think it's it's amazing to see people who, you know, the number of books, for example, that have been talked about, almost like you know, I mean, they're dropping book names like you know, you must be reading I don't know a couple of books every day kind of thing. Whether it's Timeless Steel or that other book on Dravid is a biography, which even a cricket fan like me, I'm struggling to say have I read it. I'm not sure. you know but i will go and check it out because it's apparently written by a psychologist but you know or a team of rivals which is actually a title of a book on abraham lincoln and how he might have built his his whole success story and i think it's uh, or deep work and i think there's a great so think about it here is somebody who's who, whose day job is managing other people you know managing money and and delivering great returns but that curiosity to try and read a variety of books and literature and to try and get better the curiosity to you know to go out and listen to people everybody from a butcher and das to you know to several other people who might have been talked about i think there's a lot to learn uh, learn from that and and maybe that's that's really the common trait about what does it take to hit peak potential and to become as good as you can be which is to have that curiosity to put into practice to have that thirst for knowledge to try and say what can i do to get better Uh, to not try and rely on the fact you know it would have been easy for them to say oh you know what i built that great business that everybody talks about today or you know to look back and say i built ambet or i was there or i did this or that or the other and i think to me that's been a great learning so thanks so much for for just having me on this panel i've learned a hell of a lot from this one yeah so to come back to your question i think uh, yeah uh, this the problem with i think some of the things that we might do in corporate and hr is to constantly look for this do you open you know like this uh, zero sum game is it attitude or is it skill uh, is it strength or is it weakness and i think each of them has their own place and and clearly attitude is a big one but i think uh, one without the other can actually become a little meaningless and therefore it's important to have a bit of both and to be able to demonstrate that you've got both and that you've got the ability to get it right now clearly skill is easier to train and to improve upon uh attitude is more fundamental and therefore having the attitude right is right is good uh i think the ipl has been a great story of what happens when talent gets an opportunity and how people have discovered that look you can go out there and and do something well and if you can do something well and what is that something is undefined you know and you can create that and i think you'll see a number of people somebody i'm sure there you know if you look at what uh, you know if you saw that young priyag uh, riyam parag bowling for rajasthan royals i'm sure the day is not far when you're going to get a bowler who will be bowling at a line which is just about legal which is about that shoulder height if you saw him bowl that a couple of times because that will become a skill you will get people who are very good at switch hitting you know i don't know if you know there's a cricketer called akshay makare forget akshay uh, i forget the second name but he uh, akshay carnevar akshay carnevar you know akshay carnevar is a bowler who can bowl with both hands he can bowl left handed he can bowl right handed okay. so the whole idea of if you know 
this matchups in IPL is becoming a big thing. If you get a left-hander, get your off-spinner on. Getting a right-hander, don't let your off-spinner bowl. Now, imagine now that you have a bowler who, depending on who the batsman is, he will change his hand. He'll either bowl left-handed or bowl right-handed. I think it's a great lesson for all of us in business that don't start thinking of your skill set as something which is fixed. It is not about what you learned in business school. It is not about what you learned last year. It's about saying, how can I build flexibility? How can I build adaptability into my skill sets? And that can become a, an extremely powerful tool for success going forward. Uh, and, you know, there are enough examples of what we are seeing. I look at Rahul Tewatiya. Now, who would have known what this man is all about, you know? Uh, and, and yet he's done such outstanding work. And maybe I'll, since Rahul Dravid has been our hero for the day, Saurabh, I just want to, you know, uh, maybe tell you something about how Rahul Dravid talks about this in an interesting way. And, you know, and he says how he learned something from Yusuf Pathan, you know, and uh, Rahul and Yusuf Pathan were together in that, in the Rajasthan Royals in their, you know, in, a, in their early years. And, and Dravid was about beginning to get it right. He had started to open. He was trying to get, you know, to say, how can I adapt to becoming a T20 player? And imagine now that Pathan hadn't played for India, Dravid, all-time great, great, you know, and yet Dravid says, I learned something from Pathan. And he says that Pathan, Yusuf Pathan apparently came to Rahul and said, Rahul, bhai, aapka problem ye hai na, aap out honne se dharte ho, yaar. You know, <laughs> aapko dar lagta hai ki aap ye shot maro ge, aur agar out ho jao ge, to kya ho ga? He says, aray, nahi darna chahiye, maro na. <laughs> and Dravid says, you know, my eyes opened up because I had spent all my life putting a price on my wicket. You know, this was a, a nice cliche in cricket. Put a price on your wicket. Don't throw it away. And he said, that's how I played my cricket until I realized that in a 20 over game, there is no price on your wicket. Yeah. There is a price on that dot ball. If you hit a dot, if you play too many dot balls, you're losing the game. Forget your wicket. And he Maybe. says, I learned from you, Supran. He said, Maro, yaar. Agar six ho gaya, acha hai. Four ho gaya, acha hai. Out ho gaya, doesn't matter, yaar. Aap char bar maro ge, teen bar lagega, ek bar out ho ge, doesn't matter. And I think Absolutely. that is the secret to, to success, which is to say what you've known all along is not really the right answer. You need to be willing to say no matter what's made you successful, there is a new trick that you can go out and learn. There is a new way of looking at things. Your mindset needs to be one which says, you know what, I may be Rahul Dravid. Yusuf Patan is the lesser known half brother of a, a cricketer. I've not even played for India. And yet I can learn something from him. And I think that really is what made Dravid the great guy he was. And I'm sure there's a lesson in it for all of us too. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. I think just to sort of uh, put a one-liner on that, right? One of the reasons it's such a lot of fun to, to live in India, one of the reasons I migrated to this country, there are no holy cows in India now, right? No, this is not a political thing. There are no holy cows in India now. Every day, all of us have to think for ourselves. And yesterday was a different country. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I mean, this this is a fantastic discussion we're having, but unfortunately, we are sort of close to our closing time. Uh, I'll just take uh, one common theme. I won't say one question, but one common theme coming out of audience questions that we have uh, so far. And uh, essentially, it is about going back to that collaboration and team of rivals. So, uh, you know, the question is that how do you, one is improve the collaboration quotient, and how do you ensure that proper collaboration happens within your team of rivals? So, sort of. So, so I think uh, I think this could be a book by itself. Uh, we'll give you we'll give you the case study that we've cited in the book. Uh, 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 we'll give you we can give you several case studies. Uh, uh, so, so there's the Abraham Lincoln book, Doris Goodwin super book on Abraham Lincoln called Team of Rivals, where he brings together politicians with wildly opposing views and famously. Famously, not just uh, 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 drives through the abolition of slavery, but rest, uh, basically picks up America from the ashes of the Civil War. Right? Then there's the uh, 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 India, India after Gandhi. If you want to read India after Gandhi, Ram Gua, uh, about how uh, uh, the team of rivals created our constitution. Right? What do case study? Hai. But let's come to the, the modern day Aditya Puri ji and the creation of HDFC Bank. Right? He brought together uh, uh, 96, 95, 96. The book to read is Tamal Tamal Bandhapadhyay's Tamal Bandhapadhyay's Bank for the Buck. Bank for the Buck. He brought together uh, basically ten bankers from all over the country. City Bank, say, some. Uh, 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 uh,
right now these are all sort of alpha males right uh, uh, apologies for the for saying alpha males but they were all alpha males I, 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 having read the book i can't remember at the early stages of hgfc bank there being too many women but obviously alpha males matlab they're at each others thoda sa at each others throats right so chief operating officer head of treasury head of credit risk etc etc so what does atipuri do he organizes a trip to his house in lonavla theek hai so everybody goes to lonavla think ki koi bhashan giri hoga and fir pata nahi fir we'll drink and or talk and so on so atipuri just says uh, uh, you know some chota sa talk and then he says can you go and walk my dogs right and he has three or four dogs and none of these ceos have none of these cxos have ever walked the dog before So obviously, to successfully walk the boss's dog, there has to be a degree of collaboration, right? You can't say, "Mai kichunga kutta, tu nahi kichega," right? Ya mai global man kichunga, tu German shepherd kichega. So they go off to walk the dogs in Lunavla. Per force, they end up talking. Per force, they end up talking, right? The the CXOs. By the time they come back, the the ties have started building. Thoda sa tension has cooled, and then you know, couple of bottles of something nice is opened. Uh, uh, some bread is broken. Dinner is had. by the time the team returns to work on monday the communication lines are open right wow. if you bring together rivals people who have different points of view driven ambitious people naturally you should expect thoda sa tension right if you don't have it there's something wrong with the team but as long as the communication lines are open as long as people realize we are working for a common goal uh, it will happen the challenge is if you create incent structures which make them fight right so one of the first things we did when we set up marcelus we said leadership ka koi individual appraisal nahi hoga jo bhi leadership mein hoga you are a leader you are in the leadership to aapka individual appraisal aapke bonus ke liye nahi hoga total jo bonus pot hoga sabka hoga and a common formula will drive what how much each of each of us will get so i won't say aapka bonus kyunki aapki okay apis mein aapne itna hit kiya to aapko zyada milega as soon as you do that you are creating you are creating differing goals right so if you can bring together people with disparate perspectives give them a common goal uh, incentivize them to hit the common goal keep the communication line lines open magic happens in our country magic happens yeah that's a very interesting uh, statement you've made and i think that's the right uh, statement on which perhaps unfortunately we'll have to uh, uh, come to an end to this wonderful talk i know you had uh, earlier pointed out one hour as your uh, time but i think just time just flew uh, magic happened here in this last 90 minutes thank you very much so, thanks uh, a lot we uh, loved so it thanks thank you prakash we learned a lot from you if if you if you don't mind sending us these wonderful emails that were referenced by eklavya and adwat we we do want to learn from your uh, you know emails and posts and so on sir sure yaar sora mazak kar rahe hain aap you guys you should do a session on how to read Like Sora or something like that. You know? Absolutely. I'm, I'm Absolutely. amazed at the number of books you kind of talked about, and even in the end, as if it wasn't enough, you know, you brought in Ram Guha to some, you know. So there's, I think, huge diversity of reading interest, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to, you know, being on this panel and talking to both of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Advet and Iklavya. Thank you, Prakash. Thanks. And thanks for coming. Apologies that my me. camera wasn't working. Yes, but, I mean we know, missed, missed seeing you, but uh, thankfully we could hear you loud and clear. And and no, but it was actually part of the message that Saurabh and Anupam have in their book about you know staying focused and not allowing distraction. You know, staying decluttered. So just stay focused on Anupam and Saurabh. Yeah, I was out of the picture anyway. So it's a good thing. Thank sure. you, Prakash. Thank so, you so much. Thanks, thanks, Saurabh. Thanks, Anupam. Once again, thanks, Prakash, Thank uh, you, for joining in. Thanks, uh, Akhilavya. Thank you so much. Thank thanks. You, uh, it was wonderful having you there, and thanks NHRDN for uh, bringing this uh, together. And uh, we'll meet again uh, next month. Uh, uh, let's hope it becomes offline rather than online. But if it is online, if the country is that way, then we'll have another session. And in all probability, uh, for both uh, all three of you actually, uh, Prakash, Saurabh, and Anupam, uh, most probably our next session is going to be again on cricket. Uh, uh, it's again going to be an autobiography of a cricketer. Uh, nice and uh, hope hope to have uh, wonderful panelists uh, as always thanks All once again and uh, and and stay safe enjoy stay the safe. thank you so much thank you thank you thanks for having me bye bye